started here. Um, thank you again for joining us. This is the Intro to Futures Thinking and Strategic Foresight webinar. Um, really looking forward to sharing this content with you all. Um, quick intro for me so that I'm not just a voice without a face this whole uh, hour-long webinar. Um, my name is Liz Posse Corthell. I'm an experienced strategist for MadPow, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, a little bit more about MadPow. So at MadPow, we leverage strategic design and the psychology and motivation to create innovative experiences and compelling digital solutions that are both good for people and good for business. And we work in designing the future now across these major areas of digital solutions, experience innovations, and behavior change design. So if those sound interesting to you or your organization, please feel free to reach out to us. And then a little bit about this go-to webinar interface, if you're not familiar with it. Um, so for this presentation, I'm going to present for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have about 10 minutes at the end to answer questions. You can enter your questions into the question box. Um, and then if we run out of time, you can either email us directly, you can reach out to me over LinkedIn. Um, there are different ways for us to connect uh, if any of your questions aren't answered. All right, so let's jump in to the content, futures thinking. So why futures thinking and why today? So currently, as I'm sure you're more than well aware, we're in the middle of a sort of apocalyptic future. We're really seeing the consequences of, annoying, of ignoring the future firsthand. And with this, many people and many companies are wondering how we can be better prepared for the futures that lie ahead. Wondering how do we shift from being reactive to being proactive? So one way to do that is through futures thinking. To quote renowned futurist, Dr. Sahal Anayatollah, with futures thinking, we use the future to change the present. So my goal for this webinar is to go into some of the theory of futures thinking. We're gonna also provide some things that you can start using today to start incorporating futures thinking into your current work and your current worldview. One thing I wanna say up front is futures thinking isn't necessarily a method per se. There are methods you can certainly use to execute it, but it's more of a mindset that we can use in thinking about how we approach problems. So futures thinking is where we consider what things are likely to change or stay the same in the future. It is considered by some to be an art, is considered by some others to be a science, but futures thinking really gives us a framework to talk about our current world and then how the world might look in the future. It is importantly not attempting to predict the future. Rather, it's eliminating unexpected implications of present day issues. The emphasis isn't on what will happen, but on what could happen given various observed drivers. It's a way of getting new perspectives and context for present day decisions and dealing with that dilemma that's at the heart of all strategic thinking. The future really can't be predicted, but still we have to make choices based on what's to come. And you'll notice too that when I'm talking about futures thinking, it's typically plural. So the reason for this is that all future scenarios are equally likely to happen. There is no best case scenario, no worst case scenario when it comes to the future, because both are equally likely to happen. I know that that's a little bit of a mind blowing concept, but I hope that this will be better illustrated through this tool. So this tool is called the Futures Cone. Um, and it's a model which is really simplified here um, where we see where we are today on the left in this little bubble and then on the right any number of possible future scenarios. So those are in purple, teal, red, and gold here. So some versions of this cone offer up to like seven different versions of the future but for simplicity's sake we want to stick to this model for today. So we see that when we look ahead to the future most of these futures are possible. Some of them are probable and a few of them are preferable. So to define each of those, the probable futures are those that we think are the most likely to happen, usually based on current trends, most of the time quantitative trends that we can see today. The possible futures are those that we think might happen based on some future knowledge that we don't yet possess, but we might possess someday, like fully autonomous vehicles or commercial travel to outer space, 
There are things that we can see little hints of today. You know, SpaceX is launching its rockets, but we're not quite there yet. We're not sending humans up to Mars or to the International Space Station unless they're a certified astronaut just yet. So the preferable futures are the futures that we think should happen, which is, of course, based on a value judgment. These could be futures like solving the global climate crisis or creating world peace. And lastly, these are the there are some wild cards here in golden. And those are the features that we can't currently account for. So something like if there was an alien invasion or if AI suddenly took over the planet. But some might say we're, we're living in a wild card scenario right now, so we can't write those off. And the ultimate goal of futures thinking is to create several alternate futures that live across this cone. And most importantly, to define that vision for the preferable future for yourself, for your organization, and with that preferable future, to backcast from that future to today to figure out what changes we need to make today to get there tomorrow. So what are the benefits to futures thinking? Futures thinking really helps us create a vision for where we're headed and helps us create alignment across teams and across entire organizations. It helps us move from the day-to-day -day operations, that survival tactic, to the more long-term considerations, thinking long view, thinking visioning. It helps us become more proactive and see the things on the horizon that may affect us, our organizations, and our communities. And I also wanna highlight what the difference between design thinking and futures thinking are. So if you're like me, you come from a background of design thinking. Um, my background, I went to grad school for industrial design. Um, I was very familiar with this model of design thinking where you're looking at today's world, you're looking at your observations, your insights, and you're kind of diverging, but then ultimately converging upon a product. So this could be literally a product like an industrial design, could be a website, could be a feature, could be a new tool, could be a service design, but ultimately the goal is to converge upon a thing. The difference with futures thinking is that our goals are really to look from today and diverge into all of these possible future worlds. So really focusing on opening the aperture of our possible future worlds and understanding all those different solutions that could be out there. So with futures thinking, one thing that we have to do and have to be careful of is challenging the used future. So what's the used future? So if you know me in real life, um, you'll know that I'm a huge Talking Heads fan. I'm always struck by this lyric from Once in a Lifetime, where David Byrne sings, you know, same as it ever was, same as it ever was. And I think after 2020, we all have a lot of days that feel the same. So we all can kind of relate to this feeling of like, same as it ever was. So something to consider with futures thinking is that we want to ensure we aren't creating the future that's the same as it ever was. The more technical term for this is the used future. It's a future state that's been used in the past and doesn't make sense anymore. Used future ref refers to people being busy designing for a future based on the assumption that our world would essentially stay the same. And I wanna illustrate this with a few examples. So a well-known version of the used future is the current classroom configurations, which are based off of assembly line rows. Um, a lot of our school settings are based off of factory settings with the bell for ringing you in and out, um, where you're being in rows, working kind of together in this, in this way. So we know that arranging desks in this way, in these rows, it really works well for listening to a teacher give a lecture. We also know it doesn't work as well for collaboration or for discussion. And we know that classrooms are really increasingly focusing on these things, but most classrooms are still arranged this way because it's the same, as always, same way it's always been. Um, now, so if we think about the future, you know, I haven't been in a classroom in 2020 or in a few years, so I don't know if they're currently looking like this with, you know, social distancing, technology, remote learning. We want to think about, is that a huge future going to be challenged or will it remain? You know, in 2030, will we still have classes that look like this? Only time will tell. 
Another use feature that comes to mind after recent events is the lame duck period between elections in November and the inauguration in January in the United States. So that lame duck period comes from an era of horses and buggies where transitions of power were long processes because people had to move across the country with a horse and a buggy. We see now that there are really consequences to a lame duck period with an outgoing president who's unwilling to peacefully transition power. So our modern capabilities, they don't need such a long lame duck period. And we see that many other countries around the world don't have these super long 10 week periods between elections and inaugurations. But we also see that government is very slow. So we have to think, will this last tumultuous transfer of power, will it create change in the future as we move forward? And then one more used future that might be closer to home to you, closer to an everyday occurrence, is the daily stand-up. So if you're unfamiliar, stand-up is a practice that's common on agile teams. So all team members, you know, when in person, literally stand up, uh, provide status updates to one another, ask questions, ask for help, call out any blockers that they see in the horizon, and things like that. So for most of 2020, I was working plugged into an agile team. And they did a daily stand up in person uh, before they all went remote in March. The entire office would stand up at 8.05 every morning, and it was a really great opportunity for teammates to stay engaged and informed about what was going on. However, when they shifted to remote in March, the standup didn't necessarily provide those same things. So due to low bandwidth and the size of the team, teammates couldn't turn their cameras on for it. So no one could see each other. So it looked a little bit more like this image here on the left. Um, so updates were reduced to a few categories. So things like introducing a new team member, if there were any questions, if anyone had and needed any help. So in my observations of the standup, I didn't often see people ask for help. And I'm not sure if that's because of the scale, the awkwardness of big video calls, but no one was asking for help and people were rarely talking other than the facilitator. Um, additionally, that 8.05 time made it really challenging for people to enjoy the flexibilities of working from home. Many people were struggling with childcare, other family duties at the time, and made it even more challenging to speak. You know, if you have kids in the room, it's really tough to get off mute in the middle of a meeting with 50 people. So we have to ask, does the standup make sense when, it re when we're remote? Should it shift? Is there a better way to do it? And the reason I wanted to share this example is because it shows how the innovations of yesterday, you know, agile teams are fairly new and the standup is a newer concept. And those can quickly become used features as the world around us changes. So now I wanna go into kind of some of the methodology that supports the mindset of futures thinking. So we're gonna go through asking the right questions. So these questions are adapted from Dr. Anayatola's foundational questions. So I'm gonna walk through these method questions and then I'm going to show you what they look like in action after that. So the first question we wanna ask ourselves is what is the history of an issue? We always wanna, with futures thinking, have a goal in mind. Do we want to be understanding what workforce futures in 2040 will be? Do we wanna know what our personal life will look like in 2040? Do we wanna think about what the future of education could look like in 2030? With that goal in mind, we have to understand the history of that topic. So if we're looking at the history of, of college education, um, because we want to understand what college education looks like in 2035, let's say. We really have to understand the past. It requires a lot of research. It can require talking to experts in that area, um, pulling in different voices. But to really understand the future or have any stake in understanding the future, we really have to understand the history of an issue. The next thing we want to look at is the near future. We want to look at what are the current forecasts and trends. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, this is maybe potentially when someone could do a pestle scan. So a pestle scan, if you're unfamiliar, is looking across political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental. So looking across all those realms and how they relate to your topic area. So if you're looking at the future of colleges, 
what's going on in the political world in the future of education, what's going on in the legal world, what's going on environmentally. You have to understand all these different ideas about what current forecasts and trends are happening in that area. From there, you want to look at what assumptions we've made as a team. This is really important to understand who is and isn't in the room at this point in time. So it's really important with futures thinking, as with you know any design goals, is to think about who isn't in the room and how do you get their voice heard in that room. So making sure that there's opportunities for diverse thought, diverse thinking, making sure that the people who your future will be affecting are in the room and have a voice in it. If you're you know, thinking about college futures, not just thinking about professors and administrators, thinking about students, thinking about students with accessibility needs, um, thinking about students with different financial needs. We really need to understand and make sure we have a lot of voices so we can understand what assumptions we've made. So then we go into alternative futures. So this is what people are often thinking about when they're thinking about futures thinking is scenario planning. So once we get to this step, we're looking at those assumptions and we're creating future scenarios. This could be you know, multiple, there could be all these different future scenarios where you're looking at different factors and what that future could look like. So from there, you wanna look at those future scenarios and understand which of those is the preferred future for the most amount of people involved and negotiating those elements of those futures to really fully define that preferred future. And lastly, we want to understand how do we get there. So if we are at the top of the mountain, we're in our preferred future, we can see it, we can touch it, we can feel it, we have to wonder what happened between today, you know, February of 2021, and that future, whatever year it might be in, that allowed us to get there. So what policies did we put in place? What changes did we make? What stayed the same? What shifted? We want to backcast from that preferred future to understand what challenge, what changes we need to start making today to make that preferred future a reality. So as I mentioned, I want to talk about how this can be in action. So I recently worked on a project where myself and my team envisioned what the future of work could look like for a big American insurance company following the pandemic. So in March, they faced the same massive disruption other companies and other people have faced where their working population suddenly shifted from two thirds of them being in office every day to 95% of them working from home. So they wanted to spend some time during this period to re-envision what the future of work could be. So my team did just that. Oops, wrong way. So we looked at the past. What is the history of this issue? So before, offices were mostly in person. There were a few remote workers, but by and large, a lot of the population went into an office every day. And when you got to those offices, the space, the floor plan, probably about 80% of that floor plan was dedicated to independent work, and 20% of that collaboration was of 20% of that floor plan was dedicated to collaboration. So you have a lot of independent desks, cubicles, spaces for people to work individually, and then a few spaces for people to work in groups collaboratively, you know, big rooms with whiteboards and things like that. Most of these offices were designed as open offices. You know, uh, most of us work in open offices with that kind of idea of the Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright open office that has been slowly iterated on throughout time. And most of these have bolted down furniture. So they're kind of static spaces. If you decided you wanted to move all the desks out of the way and have a huge workshop in that room, it wouldn't really be possible overnight. And then the default was that you're expected to go in. You know, you can have the opportunity to go into the office. Most of the time, if you're occasionally, you might work from home here or there if you're not feeling well or you just have something that you need to do at home that day. But the default is, by and large, most days you're going into the office. So that was kind of the history that we were working with for this project. So then we wanted to look at the near future. So what are the current forecasts and trends? So some trends that we've started seeing in the future of work is that some tech companies have started saying that they will be remote forever. So companies like Twitter have started saying, you know, 
if you want to work from home forever, you totally can. And companies like Microsoft are starting to follow suit. So with that, um, we're, we've seen that people can work from home. You know, people have shown really that they can work from home and be productive, which is why companies are starting to say, hey, if you want to keep working from home, you can. But we've also seen that that, that productivity has, you know, is a little bit of a double-edged sword because it also means people are usually spending a few extra hours a day working. We've seen some things about people working maybe an extra three hours a day, up to an extra day and a half a month. So people are productive, which is meaning that people want remote work to continue, but that productivity comes at a cost of potentially burning people out. But there are some other interesting forecasts and trends that I want to talk about too. Um, like one of them is that as companies are, you know, offering the ability to work remotely, that some people are starting to move away for some, from some big cities. So some companies that are in the Bay Area have offered incentives for employees to move away from there because it's so expensive to live there. So we've seen some smaller cities across the country have an influx of tech workers. So for instance, Madison, Wisconsin saw a 74% increase of inflow of tech workers. So if we think about that on a macro scale, it could be really interesting and have interesting political imp implications um, as population shift out of these big cities and into smaller rural areas over time. Just something to consider. So we looked at our assumptions. What assumptions have we made as a team? So an assumption that we made was that as tech companies announce that they're gonna be remote first, other companies are going to slowly follow suit. And our assumption there is because those companies still wanna be competitive with the big companies like Twitter and Microsoft. They wanna be competitive for the same talent. So our thinking is that as over time, to be competitive for that, that same uh, working pool, they'll have to offer similar things and similar opportunities for remote work. And we also are assuming that there is no going back to that primary work and office model that we had before. The CEO of Dropbox recently had said, we have opened a one-way door to remote work because beforehand, you know, companies would, often say, oh, we can't all be remote. We're not sure how productive we're gonna be. We're not sure how useful it's gonna be. And by kind of forcing everyone's hand, we've instead showed that people really can be remote and can work well remote. So that one-way door is open and it's unfor like, unfortunately for companies that wanna go fully back, there's really no going back in a competitive way. So something to consider. So, Based on those assumptions, we created three different alternative future scenarios. So those three major alternate futures were one, returning to the office, two, going remote only, and three, creating a hybrid workforce. So that return to office future is where we might see that as more of the population gets vaccinated, we might see that companies decide, you know, let's just return to business as usual. With that, they could require their employees to again commute to the office. It could see a rise in traffic again, a rise in uh, public transportation. It could also see a rise in employee dissatisfaction. It says many people have grown accustomed to the comforts of remote working over this time period. With remote only future, we might see that organizations slowly decide, you know, we're actually never going to go back. We're never going to go back to the office. Everyone's going to be remote forever. So this could result in commercial real estate taking a turn, which is a trend that we're starting to see already. And employees could move further away states and countries while continuing to work at their current role. We might also see that that might result in more burnout for employees. So employers might have more responsibility in ensuring that their employees aren't burning out and working too many hours around the clock. And lastly, we have this hybrid workforce future. So we may have some employees who want to return to their offices, some who are just dying to get back, and then some who want to remain remote forever. And organizations may need to build to support both of those possibilities simultaneously. So that could mean that shifting that office space model that I was talking about earlier, which was 80% individual space, 20% collaboration space, could shift completely 
could be 80% for collaboration space and 20% for individual desks. So employees might not even have an assigned desk anymore, but you might rather hot desk on the days that you choose to go in. A hybrid workforce also means that you could be creating barriers, seamless barriers between those in the office and those who are remote, which we didn't have before. So prior to everyone being remote, sometimes if you're working with someone who was remote while you were in the office, it was hard to engage them in the conversation, make sure their voice was heard, which the inverse being true as well. If you're working remote and everyone's in person, it can be hard to speak up during a meeting, hard to make sure your voice is heard. So we might see that there could be new technology, things like VR headsets or virtual whiteboard tools that will help us facilitate that truly hybrid office of the future. So with those future scenarios, we presented those to the, the group. We had some stakeholder input and we determined that the most preferable future is the hybrid workforce. So it gives people the benefits of both working from home and in the office without those downsides that we've experienced in the past because it's a workplace that's designed specifically to support all mo modes of working together. So I could be in the office having a call with someone in Seattle, another person in Paris, and we could be working together in a VR space. Or we could have a gigantic smart whiteboard that someone can control from their laptop, I can control in person, and we can all work seamlessly together. You know, or I could decide I'm gonna work from home one day and I'm gonna be able to facilitate this workshop with my coworkers who are in the office. So we could all use apps like Mural together. We would have audio that doesn't lag. We would have the opportunity to read each other's body language because we'd have high def screens and cameras and everything would be perfect and seamless. That's the preferred future, right? But of course, that sounds really far away and challenging. <laughs> so that means that we are at the right level of ambition. So as another futurist, Jim Detour says, any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous. So, you know, having a VR headset be a part of your working tools, like your mouse and your keyboard and a VR headset, that might be ridiculous, but it means we're ambitious with that goal. So if we really consider that to be our preferred future, what do we need to start doing today to ensure we can get there? So we laid out a plan for this client of creating this in a two-pronged fashion, with the first path being focused on becoming really, really great at remote work, and then the second path focused on creating and redesigning office spaces to support more collaboration, more social distance, and then seamless collaboration with remote workers. So in that remote work path, companies need to shed habits that made sense in the office but no longer make sense remotely. That could be stand-up, it could be nine to five hours, could be any number of things that just don't make sense when you're remote. Additionally, as humans, you know, we rely on synchronous conversations like phone calls, video conferencing to get work done, have meetings and make decisions. But we've of course all been in meetings that feel like a little bit of a waste of time and they don't always create those answers we desire. So we have to ask, is there a way organizations can get better at asynchronous communication? Can we communicate things better over emails? We've all heard and made the joke about meetings that could have been emails, so maybe that's a skill we can work on. And is there a way to enable decision-making from the bottom up that's not just top-down, so that you know I don't have to wait for my boss to tell me what to do, I'm empowered to do the things that make sense because I have that decision-making framework allowed for me. And while organizations are working on getting great at remote work, it's really time to lay that groundwork for the offices of tomorrow. Will they be open air, full of plants and sunshine that allow coworkers to feel safe together? Or will they offer homey spaces with nice cozy areas um, that, because we've grown accustomed to being in our home offices? And we have to ask too, will they begin to offer digital spaces? So digital meaning combining the digital world and the physical. I know that word is polarizing. I personally like it because I think it sounds cute. But those digital spaces that are designed for people to wear those VR headsets collaborate across the globe. So with that, I wanted to kind of drive home this point at the end here about really emphasizing why we want to create a vision for the future. So one way of doing this is through metaphor. And in Dr. Anayatola's foundational questions, 
The last of them is what is the inner story? What is a supportive metaphor to get to your preferred future? So metaphor can give us strong emotional ties for our visions of the future. So a metaphor can show us where we are today and where we hope to be tomorrow. For instance, let's say a company today sees themselves as this lovely older couple on the bench here. They're really wise, they've been around for a while, they're very comfortable, you know, maybe they're a little slow moving, but that comes with a lot of experience and a lot of expertise and they're slow but deliberate. Let's say that that company's embarking on a new business venture. And in 10 years, they say, you know, in 10 years, we actually want to be this kid at the playground. We want to be full of energy and excitement. And we want to learn about this new environment, this new venture that we're taking on. We're going to take a few spills. We're going to scrape an elbow here or there, but we're going to get back up. We're going to keep trying. They're really excited to learn, explore, and that outweighs their fear of the unknown. They're willing to test and learn, they want to iterate quickly, and they want to move on from those things that no longer serve us and develop skills that build resilience. So this is a metaphor that we can all understand emotionally. We can connect to it in some way. We've all been to a park and seen these visions, you know, maybe not in 2020, but we've been there and we've seen these things and know what they, are, what they feel like. So it's something that we can use to align our visions and goals together to set the path for the preferred future forward. Another method of visioning that I think is really important to cover as well is a method from uh, systems thinker Donella Meadows. So she gave a speech in 1993 at a sustainability conference, and I am going to share this link with you after this talk because I think it's really inspirational. I think it resonates as much today as it did in 1993. I think you'll really enjoy it. So she gave this talk about how when we're talking about the challenges we face in the world today, we talk about our problems and not our visions. She talks about how sharing our cynicisms and fear are really easy, but sharing our visions for the world are not. So we have to ask like, why is that? And how do we change that? So she talks a lot about this um, great, great workshop that she ran with people who are working towards ending world hunger. And they just talked about the challenges with hunger, the problems it creates, the destruction that hunger creates. And she said, what if we visioned a world without hunger? What would that vision look like? And it's really, it's very hard for people to talk about and understand, but she talks about why it's important. So when we create that strong vision and we speak about it, we create accountability for ourselves, which the opposite is true too. So if we don't create a strong vision, we don't talk about it, we can create a feedback loop where it's okay to fall short. We didn't say it out loud, so it's okay if we're not quite there, we can just fall short, which creates over and over and over again, we'll fall short repeatedly. But if we really work together and we really think about what we really want, not just what we think is possible, what might those visions be? There are things that people could never have imagined being possible. So let's work together to think about what beyond just what's possible. And we can write down those visions, we can share it with others. And the more that we share it with others, the more others can be involved and reveal the path forward, which can make our vision stronger. And visions also become more responsible when we share them with other people. As I talked about earlier with asking who's not in, in the room, we have to ask and think about as more people become involved, we can check our own biases and ensure that we aren't creating a vision that makes sense only for the people that look like us. And with that strong vision, we have the power to say no to the lesser visions we come across. So we all know in our hearts that incremental market-based changes aren't going to create the visions of the world we want to see, but we have, to, we have to have that alternate vision that's strong and we won't sell out to. And another benefit to having a strong vision is that it will open our eyes to the good news in the world, which I'm sure is something that we could all use after a year full of doom scrolling. So I wanna quote Adrian Marie Brown, who is a brilliant author, thinker, black feminist. And they say, when what we pay attention to grows. And this is part of their philosophy in the book, Emergent Strategy. This means the things that we pay attention to are the things that grow for us. 
if we seek out the negative and cynical ways of moving through the world, that's what will grow in our hearts. So as I just mentioned, I spent a good portion of 2020 doom scrolling, but I also know that that didn't serve me in my intentions and visions. It instead served my fears, my anxieties, and with that, those are what grew. We're still in the new year, you know, it's uh, February and we can just call January uh, 2020 extended edition. So it's a good opportunity for us to define our visions, both for ourselves and for our organizations for the future and build upon those visions and ensure they serve us well, our communities well, our organizations well, and the people around the world well. So lastly, I just wanna leave us with the words of Amanda Gorman. So if you haven't had the opportunity yet to see her recite her poem, The Hill We Climb, please go watch that immediately. It's really brilliant, it's moving, it's a potent message of a vision for the future. So what's a better way of illustrating the importance of visioning than leaving you with the words of someone who created such an emotional and powerful vision of the future? So with that, I have to turn to you and see if you have any questions. Um, and you know, you can continue the conversation with me. My email's here, my LinkedIn is here. Um, I am recently back on Twitter for after a three year hiatus, so you can join me there as well. Um, so any questions, I will keep an eye out in the questions box over here. Let's see. Okay. All right, so this is a great question from Richard. So in most ca cases, the future is already here. What are your foresight methodology you can use to scan across to find those signals of change? So one of the great ways is to look through, as I mentioned, the PESTEL scan, which is again, political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental. That can really send us signals of what is going on across areas. So it's really common in the design world particularly to stick to the area that we're in. So if we're solving a problem for a healthcare system, we wanna solve it for them, we're gonna look at healthcare. Whereas we might wanna be looking in political and legal to understand what other solutions we see coming out through those solutions. So for instance, in the legal world, you know, they're dealing with uh, challenges of privacy and trials over Zoom, which might not seem like a healthcare problem at first, but if you think about PHI and how we preserve our private health information as we're you know, doing telehealth uh, appointments and things like that, we can see that there's maybe some opportunity for crossover learnings. So it's really looking outside of just our area of expertise, outside of our area of market that we're looking in at that moment and looking to see what else is going on. There are also a lot of companies that do kind of scanning and reports. So um, I can send out some of the resources in that realm as well um, that are all, always just constantly scanning to look at what's going on out there. So yes, the future is already here, but there's more futures around the corner. So we still have to look and see what is uh, coming around the corner from all these different realms. Let me see. Does futures thinking assume that time is linear as the image of the cone shows? That's a really interesting question, Sean. Um, I think that the a vision of the future that I think in a version of linear time that I think of often is, and I forgive me for not knowing the reference off the top of my head, but I think of time as a conveyor belt where you are staying back, standing backwards. So you can always see the past, but you can't see what's behind you. That's my first personal vision of time. Um, you have some ways of peeking over your shoulder and looking forward to see what might be out there, but by and large, the most information you have is the past. Um, I don't know if everyone's uh, futures thinking mindset assumes that time is linear. Uh, you know, I think time is, an, it's an interesting question, interesting thing to query upon. Um, I think I might give that a little more thought and uh, return to that. But yeah, I think it's an interesting area of, of thought. I don't necessarily think time is linear, but maybe that's my science fiction brain. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, just flipping through some of these. Uh, let's see what other questions. 
It would be great to have a list of futures thought leaders you've been mentioning, please. I will absolutely send that along to you. Um, that will be part of a follow-up email. Okay, let's see. Um, any recommendations for getting stakeholders to buy into this type of design work? Great question, Laura. Um, so I think that part of part of the goal of futures thinking is to create a vision that people can align on. And it's really hard because that vision might be really scary for a lot of people. So part of futures thinking that is a challenge is that it's really hard to do it. It's really hard to vision the future when you're in a moment of crisis. So my recommendation is getting people to a moment of non-crisis, which is very challenging at the moment, but also not challenging, but getting people out of crisis mode and into long-term visioning mode, and then making sure their voices are heard. So, you know, we've all, if you're in the design profession, you've been in a workshop where there's someone who just isn't gonna be along from the, for the ride. They're, you know, they're gonna say the opposite of everything you say. Um, the goal is really to get them one or two rungs up the ladder, maybe not get them up to the top of the ladder on that day. But with creating those really strong visions where you have lots of input, and lots of buy-in and getting lots of people in the room, those visions can be powerful enough to create that thing, that, that buy-in from stakeholders. So um, Dr. Anayatola talks about how with uh, alternative scenarios, he often has starts out for companies asking them what their worst case scenario is. Like, what if we did nothing? What would happen in 20 years? Um, so that can be a good way to get stakeholders in, involved as well, because it can really kind of illuminate what that future might look like, which could be like irrelevance or, you know, we have no more clients or we have no more customers because we're completely irrelevant. So sometimes you have to strike a little fear. Um, sometimes you have to ease that fear and create this really powerful vision for the future. So it's kind of playing to understanding what your stakeholders need in that moment. What are my favorite couple of books on that subject? Uh, thank you for this question, Monica. Um, I will send along a list. Uh, some of the titles escape me off the top of my head at the moment. Um, I will say though that my interest in, in uh, future thinking came from a former interest in well, former, <laughs> still very present interest in science fiction. I actually started off college as a literature major, um, and then I took all of the dystopian fiction literature classes I could, and I changed majors. So um, I like to read a lot of dystopian science fiction because I think it's a really interesting vision of the future. I will also provide some more, more concrete futures thinking uh, method books than versus just um, my favorite dystopian futures. Um, okay, so this is a great question too from uh, Leanne. So in our Future of Work pro project, did you factor in the pandemic when thinking of the work productivity increase? So there's less to do, so people are working more. Yes, that's definitely something we thought about, um, but it's also something that we thought about with the opposite of that being true. So some people have a lot more on their plate as, you know, advanced childcare needs with no daycares or schools being out of session. So for some people, it's very true that they have less things to do, so they just spend a few more hours at work. For other people, it's very true that they have more duties at home now than they did maybe in you know February this time last year, but that they're increasing the burden on themselves by requiring themselves to perform extra work. We've learned a lot that people feel a lot of feelings of guilt feel a lot of feelings of burnout and like mistrust and thinking that they're not going to, they want to prove that they're working really, really hard. So they ex accidentally do an, a bunch of extra hours. So there are definitely some certain things there. I think that um, the conversation about burnout while working remotely is, an, is another conversation that I would love to have and have had recently with a lot of people. Um, so if that's something you want to follow up on, feel free. I would love to talk your ear off about it. <laughs> Um, okay, this is a great question from Francis. Uh, predict the future or create the future? What is preferred? Definitely create the future. No method can really help us predict the future. If it would, everyone would have bought GameStop's, GameStop stock like two months ago, right? Um, 
predicting the future is never really our goal of futures thinking. It is really about defining what that vision is and then creating that future today. So great question. Okay, I have more, more reading suggestions. Yes, I will send along some reading suggestions. Let's see. Okay, this is a great question. So I did not realize there was a relationship between design thinking and futures thinking. Do you think design teams should have design thinkers and futures thinkers and strategists? Yes, absolutely. I'm also saying that biased as a strategist and a futures thinker, um, but it is helpful to think beyond the, uh, beyond the product always because the reality is, is that all of our products, all of our services, all of our solutions that we have still exist in the world and will exist in the future in some capacity. So to really think about the impacts of our objects that we are creating, whatever they may be, it's helpful to think longer term about them. Um, you know, I my background was, before I studied industrial design, I studied sustainability in design, and I kind of often was thinking about when I was in industrial design school, like, are we thinking long term about what this product being in the market could have an effect on politically, environmentally, all of these different realms. So it's really helpful to have people on the team who are well versed in thinking about the future um, and thinking about the future both from, you know, two to three years out to 10 to 20 years out so that we can understand the full impact of our designs because we want to create things that are great and useful over time, not things that become burdens over time. Okay, what are the futures I am personally most excited to design towards? Thank you for that question, Samantha. Um, I personally am most excited to design towards the future that is more ecologically sustainable and more equitable. I want a future that has more equity for every person. Um, I want futures that, you know, value value human life and value how we all relate relate to one another. Um, I want to design towards futures in healthcare that are uh, preventative care facing, like preventative care focused. I want to design for futures where people have their behavioral health needs met. Um, there are a lot of futures I'm really excited to design towards. I would love to continue that conversation and I would love to hear from you too what, what futures you're excited to design for. Um, okay, we have another question. Do you change the amount of time you are looking at when thinking about futures depending on the scenario? Great question, Laura. So futures thinking is often kind of in the method of looking out at least a decade. Um, we really want to have enough space to play in, I think. And if we are thinking too close to today, it's not ambitious enough. If we're thinking 30 years away, it's science fiction at that point. So we kind of have to make sure that we're in the right leveraged area of thinking about the future. So it can be very different depending on that scenario, um, depending on what the area of interest is. But I'd say most design challenges are generally focused around two to three years away. Um, but future thinking really is about more like five to 10 to 15 years to 20 years ish. But 50 years, that's just science fiction. You know, we can all just say hoverboards and uh, high speed railways and Elon Musk will have gotten us all to Mars successfully. So we have to have to we have to make sure that we're in the right level of uh, of understanding where we want to be. Um, let me see some other questions here. <laughs> okay, this is a great question too. So how is conducting research for the future different from conducting research for the problem areas that are in the present? Great question. So for problem areas that are in the present, it's really crucial that we're you know, interviewing users that are directly impacted. We want to understand the group that's directly impacted today. Beyond that, with futures thinking, we still want to know the problem areas today, but we want to look more societally wide. So instead of just micro understanding today, we want to look macro. We want to understand different things that are happening around the world that might affect our issue or what we're looking at. It can be um, things like technological 
things that are happening are just on the cusp of happening. It can be scientific breakthroughs. It can be political breakthroughs in the power of different nations over the world. Um, it could be uh, trends of you know, social media and what social media is doing and where we think it might go. There are a lot of different things that might be driving those problem areas in the future. Whereas in the present, it's really about understanding those problems right now. In the future, it's about sensing what's going on around us. Okay, and let's see, I'm probably gonna do one more question. I'll give you five minutes back. Oh, this is a great question um, that I was hoping someone would ask. So will you always go for the quote unquote middle scenario option? So with that being uh, the example in the remote work project that we did, um, what about the extremes back to office or remote 100%? So it's not necessarily that you're going for the middle scenario option. For that project, it was kind of the middle, but also it's, it's a new idea because it's a little bit of designing for the future there. Um, so it's not necessarily that you're going for the middle scenario, but you do need to create a scenario that has more buy-in. So if that means that you kind of have to negotiate certain terms, say, let's say we're thinking about like the future of colleges. Um, all the professors want to work from home because it's, it's nice to work from home. All the college students want to you know, work from, go to the, go live on campus because it's, you know, you're moving out of your parents' house. And all the administrators want everyone on campus because it's the easiest for them. So you kind of have to, you can think of it as a middle scenario option, but you can also think about it as creating more buy-in. So kind of negotiating these bits of the preferred future, which is also why I think um, the Donatella Meadows example of like, speaking your vision of that future and getting more buy-in helps it become more responsible. Um, as in, it helps it become something that is more, more supported by more groups of people. Um, so it's easy to think of it as the middle scenario. It's also, I would say that in, in alternative scenarios, sometimes they can be wildly different. So um, some scenario projects are extremely like, none of them seem like the middle. They all seem a little wildly different. So that particular example is kind of the middle scenario, but um, in other other projects, other examples, there might not be. So great question. Thank you for asking it. Okay. So thank you all so much. Uh, this has been great. I hope this was valuable. If I didn't have time to answer your question, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can talk to me on LinkedIn. You can shoot me an email, whichever you would prefer. Um, and yeah, we can continue the conversation. It was really great to have you all here today. Um, thank you for joining me.